Allianz. Supporting all 32 counties through the Allianz Leagues. Hello and welcome to the Throwing Independent Dada's GA podcast in association with Alliance. I'm Will Slattery. Delighted to be joined in studio as always after a one week hiatus by Michael Verney. Michael, hello. Hi, <laughs> Will. We missed you last week. Me and Donica were worried about you. Actually, we thought maybe you had actually made up an excuse and just didn't come in, but you know, we're glad to have you back this week. No, I think this would have been the week now to make an excuse with the call and that. Like <laughs> everyone, like in fairness, you think you're kind of been like braving yourself coming in the conditions in here, and then you're looking at lads going out and talking out all over the weekend in absolute Baltic cold. Yeah, you were at a Mo- Moor Park. Yeah, I was in Port East yesterday. Um, How was, bad was it? It was bizarre really because their centre of excellence is behind Omar Park and from the press box you can see it and it's just it's like the hide up in Roscommon yesterday you could see the goal shaking and you're just thinking like what are we doing here mm. and you can the stand was like shaking as well like even before the game the game started actually there was about 30 seconds before the game started and the referee was getting ready to throw the ball in and it was just like hail and all sorts it's just yeah it's it's horrible no, conditions fair play to any supporters who come out in, in those sun conditions because it, it's it's a real te- I, it's funny la- last year uh, I think it was the final round of league matches I went to uh, Dublin Ross Common in, in the Hyde uh, just as a, as a punter and we got out of the car and it was pissing rain and we kind of just looked at each other like should we just go home <laughs> we ended up going to the game but it was miserable I was absolutely freezing and I was like from the first minute I threw, threw in I was like I just can't wait until it's over I can just go yeah. home <laughs> it's funny actually because we were chatting to Mickey Graham after the cab manager and they didn't actually know whether they were travelling or not until they got the go ahead at like 9 they got, I think they got the go ahead at 9.15 and they were ready to go or whatever and they met but it was funny because Cavan outnumbered uh, Cavan supporters outnumbered Leash supporters definitely 2 or 3 to 1 I'd say mm. it was like it was a glorified home game it was it was mad, and um, particularly in the the horrible conditions that they travel down. Um, yeah, you'd want to be fairly well wrapped up. You'd have the snood and the whole job. I'd say yes. Well, is it in an exposed press box or are you? Yeah, but just actually, and just from chatting to Frank and some of the other journalists, it's exposed. But at least the windows and that aren't destroyed with you know rain and stuff. Mm. You're cold, but at least you can see everything that's going on. Yeah, it's one thing that like would never get any sympathy from anyone because like you know being a sports journalist is a good job. You know it's entertaining, but like having to work at these games when it's freezing and you're exposed, like the Aviva Stadium, for instance, is you're outside like and it can be absolutely it's terrible. Like you're yeah. freezing cold. It was funny actually because watching clips of the the Wexford and Kilkenny game, Wexford Park is really really tight. Like you know the way in some pitches there's you know the sideline and then there might be twenty yards. In the Wexford Park there's the sideline and then there's like about a yard of grass and then kind of gravel and it was funny because I just saw like Ray McManus from Sportsfile and a few of the other photographers I think Ray's feet were actually on the pitch he was sitting down in the corner and his foot was like in the corner <laughs> of the pitch it's that tight like yeah. and um, yeah just like photographers I, I don't expect any sympathy as a journalist but photographers or any of those people that were brave in it the cameramen as well like must have to be constantly cleaning their cameras and stuff it's not simple oh yeah like well, I was watching Car- Carlo Dublin was on Air Sport and uh, like yeah the, 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 the rain is coming right onto the camera they have to like cl- clean it off every two seconds yeah it just uh, it brings so many complications for, for everyone involved but it, it, fair play to like any of, the, any of the games that went ahead you have to say fair play to the, to the players involved because they put on a fair spectacle in awful or like horrendous conditions yeah and I'm delighted to be joined in the studio by Frank Roach of the Herald on the line by John Milan Frank as Michael mentioned there the horrendous conditions and we did lose a couple of uh, big games over the weekend which we'll maybe talk about in a bit about the schedule and how the pressure is, is on in that regard but we did get one heavyweight clash you know Wexford versus Kenny again you know has emerged as probably one of the big rivalries in hurling over the last couple of years you know how important you think it was for Wexford to hold on and hold off Kilkenny and kind of keep that good unbeaten record they've had or, or winning record over the last couple of games well it's important enough because the flip side of that argument is that for years Brian Cody was a master at you know sticking it into the opposition if they, they felt they had a, psych- a psychological advantage over whatever county it was you know they never uh, they never refused an opportunity to kind of you know get them thinking all over again oh, so to beat you 30 points to beat you 35 points oh, like I, can, I can remember uh, a league match back oh it's I think it was 2008 and the Cork strike had just ended and um, Dennis I think it was Dennis Walsh was in charge he'd just taken whatever whatever the scenario was Cork were basically just back and Nolan Park was full and for the first half Kilkenny just sold it into them mm. they were 
possibly 15 points up at half time and the entire ground rose up in acclamation as they came off at half time and it was that was just typical Kilkenny in their pomp so uh, Davy, Davy Fitzgerald, I'm sure he'll say, "Ash, look, it's only league. It's you know, it's February. It'll well, be the totally back different." The it doesn't look like it was only <laughs> league for Davy Fitzgerald. But, but that's what he'll have been saying afterwards yeah, when he's yeah. calmed down. But but he will love that, so he will. Oh, he definitely will. And I think it's I think he's undefeated in or they've won nine of the last thirteen games against Kilkenny in all competitions. And as well as that, like the year they beat them down in Wexford Park in the championship, they had beaten them in the Walsh Cup that year and they'd beaten them in the league that year. So I think it's while it's while you could say it's only league, I don't think I don't think he'll look at it like that. Like he threw on all his big guns at twenty minutes to go. He wanted to win that game and he knew the only way he was probably going to win that game playing against that breeze in the second half was to bring on O'Keefe bring on Chin O'Hanlon Rory O'Connor and he got them over the line and you saw what it meant to them after and again the swell of optimism down there and the buzz amongst the, the home support and everything like they were all as Frank says about the Kilkenny support rising to their feet they were all rising to their feet at the end again mm. and already after him coming back this is a nice little uh, feather in the cap for them yeah, I'll bring in John Milan on the line now, John. You know, writing in today's Irish Independent, Eamon Sweeney said that Wexford are possibly the most underrated team in, in all of Gaelic games. I guess, you know, they are maybe lacking some of the marquee star names of some other counties, but what Davey has continued to get out of them has been pretty remarkable. Oh, I totally agree. Uh, you can underestimate this Wexford team this year at your peril. And if anyone, any team or any county other things that were one-hit wonders last year, they can think twice because they, they're the extremely going to be an extremely hard team to beat uh, come the summer. They're very well organised. They have a system that's unbelievable, very hard to counteract, and very hard to get your head around. Uh, the, the players, they're playing for the manager. Uh, they're giving everything for the manager, and that was evident yesterday. And... They're going to be there, thereabouts in the come the summer. Make make no bones about it. And for any team to beat Wexford, you're going to have to play very, very well on the day. You're going to have to be extremely organised. And their system, I can't get over their system. Though. For, for many, going back the last year or two, everyone was probably saying, look, uh, the, the sweeper system, Kevin Foley, he just sits in the pocket. But, you know, we found out last year against Tipperary, you know, that the sweeper system has evolved He's, it's gone on to another, another level I was actually down in Wexford Park yesterday and I was just watching how their defenders they just come in waves they're like Simon Donahue Joe Connor, Damian Rick Kevin Foley I mean Verney was a cornerback and, and Verney married me down through the years so his his sole job was you know to nullify the threat of me and stop me from scoring right so, can you imagine the shoe on the other foot? I'm going out. Bernie is saying to himself, right, I'm going on the attack. That, that poses the question to me then, that was saying to himself, well, what, what, what do I do next? And that, that's the way this works. For, I think they're, they're going to transform the game now. I think the game is, is, going, to, is going to be transformed the way this, this Wexford system of play is, 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 is starting to, to develop. And it's, it's very, very hard to counteract. Uh, I mean, you nearly got to have eyes in the back of your head. And I mean, for any opposition team going out and playing Wexford now, um, you've got to be extremely organised. And video analysis is kind of going to come into it. I mean, yesterday, I mean, the last the score the last score Dio Keith got to, to practically put him ahead in the dying seconds. Nobody tracked the run, and they're very very hard to counter right? because. It's the, the system that they have, it's the understanding that they have, the communication that they have. It takes some doing. And I think, you know, the magnitude of the game, the magnitude and the manner in which they won yesterday, with 20 minutes to go, they were one point down against Storm. It was only going to look like there was only going to be one winner. And I think, you know, going forward, I think that game is, is, is massive, massive. Um, for Wexford. I go back to the noughties when we played Cork in those epic games and, you know, we beat Cork in, in 04 and then Cork had our number for two years and then in 07 we beat him in a, we beat him in the first round of the league and then we, we met Cork again in the semi-final. We beat Cork again and you cannot, beating your rivals, beating your, you know, your opponents that you're going to come up against in summer, you can't, you can't buy beating them 
on a constant basis. And that's what happened with us in, in 07. We beat Cork in February, then we beat them in the league semi final. Then we beat them without uh, the simple when the, the, the simple gate or miss, missing three players. We have to beat them three times in the year. Then we meet them, we met them again, we drew with them. They should have beaten us that same day. And then we beat them in the replay. We played Cork five times that year. We beat them four times and we drew them once. And I think Wexford, you know, there's. They're starting to become a bit of a bogey team for, for this Kilkenny team now, and it's it's what six six games now without 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 a response, without a without a without a Kilkenny win that takes fair down. And I think Eamon Sweeney is 100 percent right. People who want to watch out for Wexford because you know they're not going to go away and they're going to be an extremely difficult team to beat as, as just, the year goes on. Just on something John said that immediately came to my head. You know, he's talking about the defenders and they're all driving forward. I don't know why he came to my head, but like Philip McMahon and Mark and Mark and the Gooch would say you know, you're thinking, you know, one of the most dangerous forwards in the game. How am I going to upset him? And it's like the Wexford backs, how are they trying to upset the other forwards? It's not just pulling the jersey or spoiling them. It's, okay, I'm going to put this guy on the back foot completely. I'm going to go forward. Someone's going to drop back when I go forward. And that's kind of what they're doing. And they're like, negating a lot of the other team's um, positives by playing to their own kind of positives. Do you know what I mean? It's funny, like, Kevin Foley is... Kevin Foley, I know Kevin Foley as a forward. He scored... I remember him playing centre-forward for the Wexford 21s. He scored six points for play against Offaly. One of his best attributes is going forward. So he's not just playing sweeper. Every chance he gets, he's going forward. And someone else is, drop, someone else is dropping back as he's going forward. It's like the two midfielders back in the day. You'd say, when he goes forward, you drop back. Someone's dropping back for him, and he's allowed that licence. And it's just... It's not really something that we've seen before. It's kind of like, I you know, someone put the day Maybe last year was like was it like total hurling almost going back to what the Dutch were doing in soccer and that kind of that's kind of what they're doing and it's funny just to see how it's continuing to evolve. He knows that if the results are going to change over the next couple of years or if they're going to get better and you know go to the next step, they have to bring it an extra step and that kind of looks like what he's doing. And you you even you even go back to the, to the last like I, I don't think any other team bar Wexford would have beaten Kilkenny. Uh, Within the, within, within in the position that Kilkenny were in yesterday, they were one point up, 20 minutes to go, playing with a gale, gale storm. No other team would have beaten Kilkenny yesterday. It's the fact that Kilke- uh, Wexford's system of play, they had a chance, they had a, they had a chance um, going into the last 20 minutes simply because of their system of play. And you look at, you look at even in the last five minutes, they're starting to develop kind of, you know, how, how football teams play, you know, the way the dub, the dubs kind of the ball retention, where they could they can run down the clock for ninety seconds to two minutes. Wexford were doing that yesterday with, with what five minutes left in the clock against the breeze. They were just ball retention was you know hand passing it over across the field, and they just suddenly they just wore Kil- Kilkenny down in the end. And we shouldn't forget, like going back to last year's All Ireland semi final, like first fifty minutes, the first half especially, how Tipperary found it impossible to mm-hmm. track the Wexford runners. I mean. You know, people would say like Wexford left that game behind them. In a way, they left the game behind them in the first half because they should have been considerably further ahead. They mm. just, you know, they were probably that close to winning the All Ireland. Yeah, very close. Yeah, you very know, close. Yeah. Um, so I mean, and and they definitely have evolved over Davies. You know, they've become a, a better, more rounded, more potent team. I think without a doubt, with every year. But do you think, are they still in the frame to the extent they were last year? Because as Frank mentioned, you know, when you have that lead and a man up with 20 minutes left in an all semi semi-final and Kilkenny are waiting in the final team you've beaten a couple of weeks prior, prior um, like you mentioned the evolution there, are they still at the forefront? Because I think in Eamon Sweeney's piece, he mentioned they're like fifth or sixth in, in the betting. So that would indicate that they're not very close in the betting public's mind. Yeah, I think a lot of the if you look at the Ireland semi final last year, and it's been what he's trying to develop the whole three years. He just, I just don't think he had the squad when push came to shove. He didn't have the the Mark Kios or the Jake Morrises or the you know these younger lads that Tipperary had to come on and change the game. He just didn't have them, and I think he's particularly put even more emphasis on that. Like Joe O'Connor, like Joe O'Connor in the All Ireland final came on last year, and he looked like a bit of a fish out of water. He's actually the one at the end of the game that runs into Sheedy, and Sheedy actually knocks him over at the end of the game. And yesterday, yeah, <laughs> yes, yesterday he was the one absolutely driving out with every ball. Walter Walsh, Walter Walsh couldn't get after him in the second half in particular. He was driving out with every ball, driving forward every opportunity. So it's the Joe O'Connors, it's the Aidan Rochford, it's the extra couple of players. I just think that's what that's what hurt them in the Ireland semi final last year. Nothing else. They just didn't have um, enough bodies to bring in that would make an impact. And I think he's looking to try and address that. I wonder did they, in a way, they started playing the occasion as well. 
you know, they played the match for 50 odd minutes and then they realised what was in We're front of them. We're nearly there, and, yeah. Yeah, and, and there, was a, there was clearly an element of panic in how they, you know, their but, puck out strategy and everything. But but, 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 you, but you know what? If they keep if they keep grinding out results against Kilkenny, you know, I think the belief is that it's starting to really grow in this Wexford team that they are really starting to believe within themselves that, you know what? We actually are the real deal. We're as good as Tipperary. We're as good as Kilkenny. We're as good as Limerick. And there's no reason why they can't push on and, and, and win Lee McCarthy this year. And John, in terms of Kilkenny, obviously yesterday they were missing some of their key men who, you know, in another day, the game could have gone differently. But as you mentioned, you know, their record against Wexford has been poor. They're likely going to have to go through them to get to a Leinster final or, or to progress further in the championship. Um, you know, where, where do you think they're at at the moment? Well, they're probably the one team that are struggling to get their heads around the Wexford system of play. So if they are going to probably push on and win a Leinster title, now let's not forget, Kilkenny have won a Leinster title. Is, are we going on three three years three years now this year, is it? Three, four, months in 16, I think. 16. Yeah. 16, so 16. they're going on four years. So they're probably the one team that are finding, finding it extremely difficult to counteract the Wexford system of play. Now look, yesterday, uh, I mean, what a big plus from was the condition in Richie Hogan. I couldn't understand why they took off Richie Hogan yesterday. Now, maybe they were just delighted to get the 60 minutes into him, but it effectively probably was the, the losing of the game because before that, he was after getting two unbelievable points. He was a focal point for, for Kilkenny in the in that full forward line. He was a go-to guy. But look, let's not forget the personnel that they were missing yesterday. They were missing all the Ballyhay lads, Connor Fogarty, the Tullerone lads. And... Uh, you know, I think Brian Cody will we have to find out an awful lot more about his team. Connor Brown went in corner back, I thought he done reasonably well. Paddy Deegan is really starting to grow for me. I think he's becoming a long song hero for for Kilkenny. And I think, you know, for Cody, I think it's just on order a couple more players uh throughout the course throughout the course the remain, remainder of the league. But I think he'll be eager to be clear next weekend. And I think next weekend's fixtures, I think we're gonna find out an awful lot about uh, so many of the teams. I mean, we're going to find out an awful lot about Dublin against Dublin against Wexford. Uh, Clare go to Kilkenny. Uh, Limerick go down to Cork, and then Galway go to Waterford. So I think next year, next weekend's um, round of fixtures are going to be going to be very interesting. I guess that's Michael if they do go ahead because like we very disrupted weekend last uh, weekend obviously Wexford Waterford postponed kind of on both days Saturday and Sunday Tip Galway uh, called off as well which kind of puts the spotlight again on the schedule like they don't have the wiggle room that the football uh, league does obviously things are going to have to be put back now and you have the added kind of complication of the quarter final still being in place albeit it's two matches this year because the top two teams from 1A and, and uh, 1B go into the semi-finals automatically so there's a lot kind of a flux with the schedule and it's just kind of it's not ideal yeah the quarter final I, I don't personally see the, the need for quarter finals I just think it's a it's not a waste of a weekend but it's an extra weekend I don't think that necessarily needs to be there reward the top two and put them into semi-finals or even reward the top of each group and put them into a final but this a lot of it comes back to pre-season competitions as well so the league didn't start till the, what it was the 25th of January I think as well so if you like it I just think the pre-season competitions are a bit of a nonsense at this stage. If you if you get rid of them, you could say we'll just say you could start the league a week earlier and give yourself a bit more wiggle room with you know break weeks. If if there's have two break weeks in the hurling, we'd say, and if something happens, then at least you can go forward to take one of the break weeks and play that week. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. We're they're very hamstrung at the moment with with the schedule. Like wh- where are they going to fit, fit in the hurling matches? I'm just I'm just not really sure. Yeah, I think. Frank, we were discussing earlier, they'll probably have to put the f- everything back to knock it back a week. I would imagine what yeah. happened last year and maybe they'll have a double header of a, a football and hurling finals in Crow Park, potentially. But I mean, it's, I suppose you can't ignore the fact that, you know, the GAA isn't immune to climate change no more than anyone else. I mean, this is three years in a row where uh, there's been major disruption caused. And like we all know, probably February is the worst month of the year in terms Terrible, of yeah. erratic, you know, weather in Ireland. Um, and it's just, it, it probably is, at this stage, it's a bit of a nonsense. Having quarterfinals, and especially the way the hurling is, is structured, you know, they you could say they got lucky with the football. This time they were able to play the matches, um, you know, the, the, the three, three games that were, matches that were off, postponed. Yeah. 
Um, you know, they're, they can't do that with the hurling now. Everything's going to have to be set back a week. Um, and that and what happens that effects if on clubs as well and count clubs that were trying to get their club month maybe started at the end of March and that maybe as well. So it's it gets a bit awkward, like you know. And it's almost as if like you know we have to we have to have it done. We have to have it done by. I I can totally understand the logic of you know having the you know the 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 club only month, but then they're trying to squeeze everything into an impossibly tight schedule. Mm. Yeah, as far from my idea, I guess one game that didn't go ahead, that did go ahead rather, was uh, the game you were at over the weekend in uh, in Carlo, uh, Dublin, with a good second half display, I guess. To, to get 20 points in that conditions is pretty good going, especially because it was quite tight in the first half. It was it was kind of a weird match now. Unfortunately, we didn't have windscreen wipers in the press box in, in uh, Cullen Park, but uh, we just about got to see the first half. The weather improved in the second. But not for the first time, Dublin... Uh, struggled with the elements I mean they had whatever I mean it was a difficult win to play in no matter what but they had the, the wind in the first half and they only scored six points they were six points to four up and if it wasn't Dublin v Carlo you would have been thinking this game is set up for the home team to push on but Dublin just the, the game was totally transformed in the second half the rain relented and Dublin probably because of the elements started running the running uh, the ball a lot more and in the first 15 minutes after half time, the, the gulf in terms of their physicality, their power and their pace kind of blew Carlo away. And maybe Carlo started to run on empty as well. You know, this often happens as well when you've got a minnow, you know, trying to survive at that level. Um, so Matty Kenny afterwards, he sounded, you know, very chipper and content with the performance. I don't think he would have been happy with the first half. And as John alluded to there earlier, we're going to learn an awful lot more about Dublin this coming weekend because I don't think you can make, there's no way you can make definitive judgments based on an 11 point win over Carlo or even beating Leash uh, by seven, you know, a couple of weeks earlier, albeit they'd lost to them last summer. Like, But, mm. um, you know, this is going to be a real test. Yeah, because John, I guess the other big test in the league was the opening uh, weekend against Kilkenny. They were kind of roundly beaten in that. So, it's an important it's an important game early in the season for Matty Kenny and his team this weekend. Yeah. I told I totally echo what Frank uh, just said there a few minutes a few minutes ago. I think, you know, the one game where they would have been thoroughly disappointed was that first game against Kilkenny where I thought they were deplorable on the day, you know, and by Dublin standards you fully expected them to to beat Leash at home uh, and and Carroll and I think the big test for the big test for Maddie Kennedy and the barometer test for Dublin, albeit it's only coming about the last weekend in February, uh, is Wexford Saturday night. I'm actually doing that game myself. I'm really looking forward to it. So I think we'll find out an awful lot more about uh, Dublin after Saturday night against Wexford. That's going to be a cracker in Crow Park. Because such things, so obviously the, the way the league is structured, you know, it has its flaws, but you have all these Leinster teams in together. It's kind of like a, a, you know, a preview of, the, of, of later in the year. And there's just... Some of these games are just so going to be so crucial. Like you know, Dublin Wexford is another one in the summer that will probably decide if either of them get to they get to progress. So it, it's kind of maybe a phony war is is maybe underselling it a bit much, but there'll definitely be an element of you know feeling each other out. Yeah, if you can win the game without showing too <laughs> too much, that's yeah. probably the, the ideal scenario. Wexford probably sh- showed quite a bit against Kilkenny, against Kilkenny, and they showed that they clearly wanted to get the win by bringing on all the artillery best at the end but yeah I, I, I definitely agree with what the boys are saying about Dublin like Dublin were awful in the first game there's a like they won the last two games which you would have fully expected them to and you'd expect them to win as they did relatively comfortably um, we we don't really we don't really know anything about them it's, it's a funny kind of league like that we don't really know much about Clare either yet you know Clare but, 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 go on sorry what but, but again going back just on sorry if you're cutting across you the Dublin and Wexford fixture right again you go back to Dublin and Wexford the last within the last twelve months, eighteen months, David Fitzgerald, he won't want to be going up there now and getting beaten by, by Dublin and kinda of giving Dublin a little psychological booster before they meet down in Wexford Park in the summer. So I think David Fitzgerald, I think he has a reasonably good record against the dubs, both in league and in championship action. And I think he'll want to he'll want to he'll want that to continue um Saturday night and I think Wexford will go all out to, to beat Dublin on Saturday night and you know Matty Kennedy we were probably looking at the fixture and saying you know what lads if we can get one over on, on, on Wexford Saturday night it's just another little psychological booster for them going out to Wexford Park in, in the summer so there's all little subplots that you're going to 
see unfold throughout the course of this league. And this weekend, there's going to be a couple of subplots where teams are going to be anxious to try and get one one on over one over on on the other, on the other team. Jez Mull, I think you're after merging Matty Kenny and Greg Kennedy together for this Matty Kennedy character. <laughs> Is that? <laughs> Uh, less frivolously Um, an interesting thing you mentioned Dublin scored 20 points at the weekend in in horrific conditions five of the six starting forwards didn't score Uh, they got an awful lot of scores from from deeper positions now Reen McBride started at wing forward and was was brilliant but he actually then reverted to midfield and Chris Crummy who had started at midfield went to centre forward and uh, did well in the second half and actually you know threatened a couple of goals in the first half as well so, like, there's interesting things going on in that kind of middle section of the field. With That's Dublin. interesting now because he's they have a surplus of backs, so they, he might be looking at Crummy as a possible option and as a ball winner maybe option as well. Quite likely, and and the other, the, I think Dublin have had an issue at midfield for the last couple of years. You know, they're very unsettled. You know, their their pairing keeps changing almost from game to game. And uh, in fairness, now on on Saturday's form, Maureen McBride, whether he plays in the half-forward line or midfield is definitely, I think, you know, he, he's worth a longer look there. Um, but but it is like, I think Crummy has been playing up front for his club as well of late. Like So, you know, it's it's it could well be one they're looking at. And like, I thought this year with the return of, you know, Donald Burke and Mark Shute have been available again, that Dublin would actually, they'd have a more potent look on their forward line, that actually it would definitely add to them. Neither of them went went that well at the weekend, but I I think there definitely is yeah. there's plenty more yeah. in them. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see how they go against Wexford and Saturday. And you you touched on Clare there, uh, they uh, beat Leash at the weekend. Good performance from Tony Kelly, who's had a very good start to the league. And Clare won three from three under Brian Lowen, but again, I don't know is there much to, that we can re- really read into it thus far. Yeah, it's very hard. To t- I think it's kind of hard to take much from it. Leash were Leash were very good, um, especially considering I think um, a good few of their players got showers at half time to warm up. They were that cold, like, and it's actually hard to 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 understate. Uh, football not so much a bigger ball. It's easier to get your hands on it in hurling. Like if you're not warm and you can't like feel your hands like you're just like running around the field like you can't you can't have any effect on the game and I've had that that kind of that thing before like at least corner back you flick a ball away or something and it's grand like mulled no like if you're not warm and you get a ball you have to be able to strike the ball as a forward 50 yards over the bar so it was awful conditions there striking was poor touch was poor it's bound to be there was one stage one of the leash forwards got a ball and he actually just couldn't really get his hands on it and just kind of scooped it away to another fella but um leash were good and listen to brian lowen's interview after he seemed very relieved and basically admitted that leash were the better side for the for the goods of an hour um and considering the bodies that Leash are missing um, that's kind of that's a good sign for them they'll want to they'll want to beat Carlo and avoid being in a relegation match and yeah. they'd be happy and I think they'd be happy enough with their league with that just to avoid the pressure of that relegation game but um, on the other side then Clare started a different spine in the defence Shane Golden who we'd kind of grown to know as a midfielder ended up full back and did well but it's hard to know it's hard to know in that situation and with the conditions um, whether that's something to look at long term. And Cottle Malone, who had been playing midfield and wing back, went centre back. So it's that flip from Connor Cleary being full back and Pat O'Connor being centre back the week before. So he's definitely experimenting. But the one thing he's, uh, Brian Lowen definitely seems to be looking at is Tony Kelly midfield and Davy McInerney beside him. So mm. that's interesting. And it's quite positive as well. Yeah, well, a couple of interesting tweaks there. And I guess the other game of the weekend, Westmead ran Cork, for, you know, very close for, for long spells of that game. And maybe you're lucky enough to get something out of the game. Well, did now it was just I've, all I saw was the highlights, yeah. and like I'm sure that in a way they'll be kicking themselves. They, you know, they lost because of the three goals they conceded, two of them were penalties, and one of them was an absolute gift. You know, yeah. I mean, it, you know, it should never have, it should never have gone in. So, but th- th- it's still an encouraging performance given the heavy beatings they'd taken, like in the first two rounds. Uh, this was always going to be a really, really difficult uh, step up for Westmead. And, you know, you would have been looking before the, the league had even started, you would have said there were probably ringers for a relegation playoff. And that's probably what's going to happen now, like be it against Carlo or Leash. Mm. Um, it's all about their last game. It is all about the relegation match for them, really. That's yeah. their most important game in the spring. Like, And if they can pull a result and stay up in the top division, I think they'd be absolutely delighted. Shane O'Brien seemed quite optimistic after. like That was their best re- best performance so far and their best result by a mile so far, having been beaten, I think, 23 points by Cork in the Championship in the same ground last year. So mm. I'd say he'd be happy enough that they're starting to motor a bit. And like Colin Bonner, like he, he more or less uh, agreed that you know the performance at the weekend was Carlo's best performance of the three games so far. 
But he repeated several times in his interview afterwards that they're struggling to get scoring options. You know, they're not. They'd, they'd only three scorers uh, at the weekend, two scorers from play, four points from play, you know, and um, that's where you really see the difference when those teams are, you know, the, the difference between if you're operating in 2A for argument's sake or even last year's 1B compared to what yeah. they're facing now. Mm. Yeah, well, John, I might let you have the last word. It was, Kerry had a good win over Mead at the weekend, a really good performance from Shane Conway, who's been in great form, you know, at, at the Skibbon Cup level as well. And a, a guy who probably doesn't get that much credit, you know, uh, you know, playing for Kerry, but as someone who's been a really, really top-class forward over the last number of years. Yeah, he's a top, top player. He was, he was, he was brilliant for, for uh, UCC, both the semi-final and the final. And, you know, he'd grace any county team uh, across across the country and Kerry, uh, I think they've played just three games. They've won, won their first three games, going very well under Fintan O'Connor. And you know, there's something something actually positive happened to them, Kerry, because I think they're during the Munster Championship under 20 this year. I think I read there somewhere last week that they're going to be playing Cork in the first round, which is fantastic to see. But look, that division two way, uh, you know, this really it's really tight there at the top. You know, you've Antrim and Offaly got called off the weekend, but Kerry are in a fantastic position, and you know it's it's great to see someone like uh, Young Conway getting getting the recognition he deserves because he is a fantastic player. But you know, roll on to, to week four. We've got some unbelievable games to look forward. To. I think we're going to find out an awful lot about Clare as well the weekend. There's no better place to go um, than the Lions Den in in Nolan Park the weekend and try and find out about a bit about your squad. And I think it's great that you know an awful lot of teams are, are starting to experiment, trying to try out things you know Chris Crummy at centre forward and Clare trying to uh, try out things and trying to find out a bit more about their team and trying to find out a bit more about the personnel and I think that's what we're going to see unfold next weekend and probably the weekend after and which will lead us into the into which will hopefully lead us into great knockout games and then we'll follow on then into the summer Well a lot to look forward to next week fingers crossed the weather holds up John thanks so much for joining us No matter man Well that's it for Hurling on the Throne we'll now talk a bit of Allianz Football League action, Michael, and you were dropped into the wonderful world of Division 2 uh, football over the weekend. You were at Leash versus Cavan, and just, I was telling Frank before we came in, I just kind of sum up the kind of craziness of Division 2 in the football. Two points separates first from eighth, but you also have Armagh beat Cavan by 13 points, Leash beat Armagh by six points, and now Cavan beat Leash by 10 points in that little uh, triangle. And you also have Cavan, or Kildare beating Fermanagh, who beat Ross Common, who beat Clare, who beat Kildare. So you have two little circles uh, of, of victories and defeats there, which kind of sums up the madness of it all but I guess with Cavan in particular it's an interesting one Michael because they have so many absentees going into the league I think a lot of people maybe tipped them to go down then they had that heavy beating in week one but they bounced back with two very good victories and all of a sudden they're contending for promotion yes yeah, it's the wacky world of division two isn't it like if you're if you're going by farm lines like if it was horse racing parlance you'd, you wouldn't have much money left anyway back in farm lines because it's, it's all over the place basically um, it was funny to hear Mike Quirk kind of talking after yesterday just said like we looked at the, the Cavan result the first day and we, we knew they weren't that bad we knew they were missing bodies but we knew they weren't that bad um, they were they were quite good yesterday in fairness like and Leash were poor but Cavan were like after the 28 minute Cavan just dominated the whole game and played the elements really really well um, the Jor Smith bombing forward from, from wing back he got three scores Oshin Pearson got three from playing the first half as well but it was kind of either side of half time they got a goal deep into first half injury time uh, lucky goal to be honest with you and Evan Doherty lobbed the, lobbed the keeper I think he was going for a point and then Stephen Murray in one of the cases of it has to be one of the best cases super sub of all time he was on the field he got brought on a half time he was on the field his first touch was a palm in over the leash goalie for a goal and then in deep into second half injury time he got an absolute rocket of a goal so he got two goals and he's a corner back basically as well which was phenomenal um, but Cavan were good despite what they're missing you know everyone knows they're missing you know Darren McVitie Connor Mina, Killian Clark uh, Niall Murphy I think is injured as well um, they're missing a lot of guys but they've totally kind of solidified their place now. It looked like they were under pressure and it was all doom and gloom, but they've kind of got the, the train back on the tracks again and sure they're in a great position now again. Yeah, Frank, like, so looking at that table, who are the, the two teams for you who are most likely to come out? It's probably impossible to call, oh but like, God. if you yeah. had to kind of have a look at it at this moment in time... Who, uh, Arma probably at this stage. I know uh, actually at the start of the league, I was thinking, I thought maybe Ross Common. Uh, and Kildare but like Kildare after 
not alone have they lost two of their first three matches, but, you know, they lost really poorly in Armagh the last day as well. Uh, and, like, like, there's no more wiggle room left for them, I would imagine, mm. you know. Okay, the, the whole division is that congested. You can't, see, you know, you know, in a week's time, we could be looking at a very different table again, you know, and a, a team that is sixth or seventh at the moment could be up to third. But, um, you know, Armagh probably at this stage, uh, Roscommon have shipped a couple of, big injuries as well early in the campaign and um, you know that that's going to be difficult for them as well they have you know? a serious amount of bodies missing um, from the lot recent years like I was just Seamus Duke the journalist in Roscommon went through all the names like mm. high profile enough names that would stand out to you that are missing and you just can't afford to be missing them but they've, they've done yeah. okay and they've they've squandered two leads in the first two games and, as and well. like in fairness if you look to their fixtures I think from memory I, I don't have them in front of me here but like they would have been looking at their first three games and that's where we need to build up a bank yeah. of points here and they've only got what three so you know that um that could come back to haunt them, I'd say. Yeah. Um, like my own county, Westmead, I'd say they'll be delighted to have four points at this stage. Um, I don't think they'll go up. I think uh, some Westmead fans would be quite happy privately if they don't go up because their experience when they've gone up to Division 1 over the last several different stages over the last decade and more has been very painful. It's not funny when you say that. Like, I think a lot of teams would just be happy to stay up. And I like I, I don't this year of all years. Yeah, I don't think many teams will be pushing for the to first or second. I think a lot they because they know it's coming down the road next year and it's going to be a difficult division one. I think a lot of teams will be happy to finish three, four, five, and six. Oh yeah, really well I, I I think they'll be uh, for their own pride as much as anything else. They will not want to be relegated and say right we're going into tier two, even though in a way it might be better for them. Do you know, I mean like Westmead's first Leinster Championship match is against Dublin. Their last Leinster Championship match is against Dublin. That's what's going mm -hmm. to happen. So they're go uh, if they, you know, presuming they're not relegated, they'll go into the qualifiers. However long that might go on, you know, you know they could. They ha they've had some great runs in the past, but they're not going to win any trophy at the end of the year. So you know, the only thing is, if a team is relegated from Division Two, they're not going to be in a good headspace going into Championship. Yeah, it's interesting. Frank says there about you know how some teams you know division or the Tier Two would be good for them because I think they're meant to be announcing the name of it in the in this week I think maybe it's at the Congress. I think yeah, yeah, or in the near future. Um, because it's being treated like a trap door into oblivion that it's going to be like oh it'd be a quad disaster like you're basically irrelevant. But is that really the case? Do you think like or as Frank's you know alluded to there. Will there be some positives for some counties going forward this summer? I think a lot of it depends on how it's like treated. Like without being smart, in, in media terms, are they going? To, are they going to get much coverage? And people will say, "Oh, you, you don't. You shouldn't need coverage to be playing intercounty football, or that's not what it's all about." But like people would like to be, if you're playing tier two, to be reading about it, to be hearing about it a lot more. Like you look at the lower divisions in Ireland. Do you hear about much about them? Not, not really. It's call a spade a spade. When you only because awfully were. You know, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> and then it's like. Joe McDonough, you hear around finals time, you're hearing hear about that. And then Christy Ring, Laurie Marr, Nicky Rackard, you, you know when it's the final weekend, that's when you hear about that. Like, we want to hear, tier two, you want it to be consistently heard. You want it to be, you want it to mean something. The fact that there's no name on the trophy now, I think, is is not particularly good at this stage. Like, when it was brought in, I thought they should have had something ready to go. Like, so they were, at least, everyone's just talking about tier two, whereas they should be talking about the Frank Roach Cup or whatever well, it is. It's definitely not going to be the Tommy Murphy. <laughs> Mar two cup anyway, like yeah. Well, they can't, they can't afford that. But but I, I, I mean, I can see the logic of maybe why they did it. You know the the, the schedule they have for running it off. But you know, so at least those counties, you know, they can concentrate on club action after that. But I just thought it was a, it was a no brainer. The final should be on as the curtain raiser to the All Ireland Senior Final. I think mm -hmm. because you can say it would be what well, would be buried by all the talk with Senior Final. I think it would be great because. You know, there is so much coverage in the run-up to an All-Ireland final that there will be, straight away there'll be that match would get a lot of coverage too. There'd only be yeah. two big matches on that weekend. We've heard a lot of we've heard everything we need to hear about Dublin Kerry, you know. Yeah, yeah. Dublin Kerry again, you know, there's only so much. Yeah, whereas the, the final is going to be on I don't know, is it the weekend, the last weekend of the Super Eights, whenever it is in, in early August. And you know, it'll get a bit of coverage, but it won't get near nearly enough. Mm. And, you know, I also think at this stage the minor final is now it's an it's an under 17 competition mm. it is it's a, a developmental competition more than it ever was before you can even see physically when you're looking at the the minor final they're not they're not as big as they were no. they're not like they're not like men necessarily and it's not necessarily even fair on those youngsters to be sort of thrown into that kind of a spotlight you know mm. 
But our senior players just absolutely love that. And you're going to have 30 to 40,000 in for the start of their game, probably. Do you know what I mean? You're going yeah. to have 60 to 70 in in the closing stages. It'd be, br- it'd be brilliant, like, yeah. yeah. And we were focusing a lot about Division 2 and the teams who might drop out. But Division 3 is equally competitive. I, Cork have obviously gone 3 from 3, but just below Cork, you have Longford on 5 points in second. And then you have four teams, Derry, Down, Offaly, and Tipperary on three. So all vying for that second promotion spot. Obviously, Offaly beat Loud uh, at the weekend. And another, they always seem to be involved in very kind of <laughs> frantic finishes in it's the league. It's never simple, is no, it? No, it's not. Um, like, what, what, what would be the, the hope there? Like, do you think they could sneak into that second promotion spot? Uh, well, like last year, it kind of came down to near the last weekend where they were like hoping to be saved. Like, so I but think they could have actually, you know, they yeah, could have easily been. Yeah, a, the other result, like there was a score in nearly every game last year, so they could have been on the other side. Um, I don't, I don't know. I think if you want to be promoted, they probably should have been beaten Longford at home. Realistically, those sort of games, it's good, to, great to get a win on the road because they haven't had too many wins on the road in recent years. They were, I think, they were two seven to three points up and looked like they were going to coast home. And it was like a real struggle. Like uh, Pat Noel and a journalist there from Offaly was just saying, like, and it happens to me regularly where you're following an Offaly game on Twitter and you're like, oh, they're up by 10 points, it's great. And you're covering another game somewhere else. And then all of a sudden there's this like flood of scores and it just the deficit gets smaller and smaller <laughs> and you just don't know what's going on. And it's kind of that's kind of a weekly thing, but at least at least they, they got a result and um, they're leaving themselves in with a shout now anyway. Yeah, because they're a very entertaining team to follow. And I guess just as we were looking at the Division 2 table and for Forecasting like some t- counties like Derry and Down in particular probably would have eyes on, on getting that second spot. Like you know, if they were to not be involved in in the you know Tier One Championship or and even Tipperary, who you know not too long over in our semi final, like Longford and Offaly would probably be more aspirational. But for the other counties who'd be used to maybe being involved, you know, it would be quite well. A bit. Well, Derry, Derry before before a ball was kicked in this campaign would have been touted as. Most people's favourites, I think. A lot, sorry, along with uh, Cork, Cork, Cork yeah. were probably the the obvious front runners. But a lot of people would say Derry are the team to go up, and uh, especially I'd say Rory Gallagher will not be a happy camper if um, you know at the end of this he's facing into an Ulster Championship and then you know more than likely heading for the Tier Two, like. You know that would be that would be a serious setback for Derry, I would say. Yeah, again, when you said you know Offaly should have been beating Longford, like Derry and Leitrim drawing in in week one could be a result that you know could really come back to haunt them at the end. Big time, yeah. It's uh, that, and even looking at Division Two, you're talking about like Kildare had to be beating Clare in my view. A uh, uh, Clare minus Gary Brennan. There's certain games that you kind of have to get points on the board in, and I would say I would say the same uh, for that fixture you just mentioned there. Like yeah, it's. The Leitrim game, they would, they probably would be kicking themselves. Yeah, in fairness, mm. um, but th- league football is great in that sense. Like, it's so, it's so tight across the four divisions. You even had you had Wicklow winning yeah. in Divi- in Division Four yesterday as well. Like, and that kind of that's a bit puts a bit of a spanner in the works for Sligo's promo- promotion well, push. Yeah, just quickly on Division Four, you have Limerick uh, on top with three out of three on six points, and then you have Wicklow, Sligo, Antrim, and Wexford all on four. So again, just like the other divisions, very difficult to call at this stage. You might come out of it, and it would be a nice boost for any of them because they some of them have been in Division Four for for a while. That would be massive. Yeah, like getting to play in Crow Park in the Division Four final is that could be you know your high point of the season. So it's it's a huge it's a huge uh, carrot for any of those. Yeah, and it's kind of like Division Two, three. And four Cork aside, maybe in Division Three, everyone will just beat each other. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And it's kind of just who's who's able to survive at the end of it. Yeah, it's also a great advertisement for the league structure. Uh, uh, you know, the the kind of um, almost the democracy you see in 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 league football that this is the best competition for the majority of counties mm. playing because you know they're they're going to go face into a provincial championship where they know they don't really have a chance of winning it. Whereas here, not alone. I have the you know potential chance of winning silverware, but they're playing teams of similar standard week in week out, and you know f- you know the vagaries of form. That's why you get some of those crazy results mm. there as well. You know, and isn't it funny? Like every weekend we're looking forward to, particularly in football, because uh, I I find I'm not energized in by the football championship. But every weekend in league, you're looking forward to a Dublin whoever, a yeah. Kerry whoever, uh, a Donegal against. Do you know what I mean? Like swap places then later in the year. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of every week, and then it's like during May you're kind of waiting to June, and then sometimes you're waiting to July or a big shock or something like that. Whereas the whole way consistently through the league. Across all but four yeah, divisions. The, the Division 2 chat is often the most entertaining yeah, part yeah, yeah. of football chat of the week. Uh, I think we did quite well to get 41 minutes out of a weekend where there was <laughs> allegedly meant to be only hurling and there was a raft of games cancelled. But we did it anyway. Michael, Frank, thanks so much for joining me. Cheers, Thank man. you. Cheers. 
And that's all we have time for this week on the Throne and Association with Allianz. Thank you so much for listening. We will be back next week to review all the hurling and football action. And in the meantime, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, SoundCloud, or listen on independent.ie. So until next week, thank you for listening, and goodbye. Allianz. Supporting all 32 counties through the Allianz Leagues.